Okay, New Testament church government, TH 113. This is chapter 7 and lecture number 7. All right? One of the most misunderstood offices or titles in the New Testament is the office of deacon. And we're going to find out, uh, well, we've seen that there's different kinds of church government that develop uh, during the Protestant and after the Protestant Reformation. Uh, and don't get upset with me because some of you all, I, I was raised Southern Baptist, okay? There's probably nobody got more folks saved than Southern Baptist. But understand that the Bible does not teach that a church is run by deacons and that they are elected by the people. It just doesn't teach that. In fact, it's almost contrary to every principle in the Word of God when it comes to church government. All right? So let's go to church. Let's go to the uh, Word of God and let's see what it is that God wants us to see. Um, I want you to look in uh, Acts with me. And uh, we're going to look together in um, chapter 6 of the book of Acts. Okay? All right. Now, in those days, when the number of the disciples were multiplying, there arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists. Now, there were Jewish Christians who were Hebrews, and then there were those who had been under Greek influence, possibly not Jews, and they were called the Hellenists. And there may be Jews that were under that influence. Because their widows, referring to the Hellenists, the ones who weren't Hebrews, their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. Now let's stop for just a second. When you read the early church, you see it says they had all things in common. And they were all eating together, and they were all, and you say, well, does the Bible teach that? Should we all just, you know, stop working and just all live together? And what, what should we do? Well, you've got to understand the situation. These men have seen a man raised from the dead. These men have actually watched him, along with hundreds of others, ascend into heaven. And telling them that they were, and then after he ascended, two white figures says, as you see him ascend, so shall he descend. And so they're like, you know, okay, they didn't have a Bible. All they had was the Old Testament at that point. They're walking through this thing, experiencing as God, you know, puts it on them to experience it. And so what would we do if we had seen something like that? I'll tell you what we'd do. We'd all camp out at the church. <laughs> we'd all be camping out and sharing with people and telling them, hey, you come get their heart to Jesus and he's coming back soon. And we'd all be, we'd all be hanging out together because this was unbelievable. And now there's thousands that are receiving Jesus. And, and so it's, it's an amazing situation. So in the beginning, they all did. They just they, they ate together and they took care of the widows and they were just, you know, everybody just doing what they can because, you know, nobody's thinking about tomorrow. They're thinking about today. You know, they're, they're looking at what, what they're going through and we don't, they, you know, they're not quite sure what's going to happen next. I mean, you know, they weren't sure about a lot of things that were going to happen and they happened. So they, they're just trying to figure things out. So they're, they're especially taking care of the widows. Early churches always took care of the widows. And that's a failure of the church. The church has failed to take care of the widows and of the children, the orphans, and the poor. Yes, we have orphanages that Christians run. We have all these good things. But you know why we have a welfare system in most of our countries? Because the church stopped providing the welfare. There was a point that the church provided it. In Europe, you had a massive uh, welfare systems that the, the Church of Europe operated in. And through the Middle Ages, the monks built these tremendous monasteries. And they took care of the elderly, and they took care of the orphan, and they, they fed those who were hungry. They fulfilled the gospel. Today, we just say, well, let the government do it. Let the government do it. Well, you know what? Whoever feeds you becomes your master. And so they're going to love the government instead of love Jesus many times. If the church was the one that was feeding them and the church was the one that was helping them with jobs and helping them with finances, 
they would love the church and they'd love the Lord Jesus Christ who was head of the church because they know who's caring about them. So we failed very bad in that situation. But from the very beginning, the early church took their responsibility of taking care of the poor, taking care of the widows, taking care of the orphans very seriously. So there's a dispute because the Hellenist widows says we're not being fed properly. So the 12, meaning the, the apostles that were, at that time, this is the early days before Paul or anybody else, the 12 summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, listen, it's not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. And so we can give ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and Holy Spirit, and Philip, and it begins to list the ones, and they set them before the apostles. And when they had prayed, meaning the apostles, and laid hands on them, then the word of God spread, and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. Now, if you think for one minute that this was a board of deacons that was telling Peter, James, and John what to do, you got another thing coming. That you don't see that anywhere in the Bible. You don't see that anywhere in church history until the Congregationalists in the 15, 1600s, and then they come about into a congregational government, uh, people rule government, and, and then they elected uh, deacons. And, and you know, supposedly the deacons served the people and the pastor under the pastor's direction, but you and I both know that's not true. If you've got a deacon board in a church, you know that they're going to rule the church and they're going to rule the pastor. And instead of him doing what God tells him to do, he's got to do what the deacon says do. And if he don't, he's going to get fired. You know that. It's politics. That is not what God wanted. He did not want it to become political. He did not want that. These deacons were appointed. And the word there is diakonos. And that's very important because it's used a few times. It's used again, for instance, when they were sent to, uh, to help people during the time of the famine later on in the book of Acts. And some of them were appointed to go do that. They were, uh, diakonos is a mission or a responsibility or a ministry. And I say that this is what deacons should be. Deacons should be people. Now, the, the congregation can recommend them if they want to be recommended. And, but they should be under the pastor's authority and they should be appointed to task. There's no such thing anywhere in the Bible, anywhere in the first 1,500 years of church history do you see a deacon board sitting around telling the pastor how to do this and how we're going to do this and voting on this and voting on that. In fact, God hates voting. He never, he, he likes a consensus. He, he, there's nowhere in the scripture you see that five are in favor and four are against. When you get into voting, you get into politics. Politics is voting. And we go and we vote for the best we can do for our politicians. And if any of us really knew all the things they were doing behind our backs, we probably wouldn't even go to the polls. But unfortunately, because we have to have a government, we're going to vote for people to try to keep the government going. So we will have our streets paved and our teachers paid for our children and so forth and so on. But that's all it is, is politics. They were assigned a task. Now in the churches I've pastored, here's what I would say. I would say, if you want to be a deacon, I will try you out. And if you do the work you're supposed to do, then as far as I'm concerned, you, you're, you're, as long as you're deaconing, you're a deacon. As long as you're deaconing, you're a deacon. So I would have a deacon in charge of the ushers and opening up and closing up the church. I would have a deaconess, and we're going to talk about them in a minute, who may be in charge of the nursery. And if a woman wouldn't be able to oversee it, I'd use men to oversee finding if you had to hire ladies to come in and work the nursery. Did you do that? I would have a deacon in charge of the maintenance of the church. In other words, deacons are supposed to be deaconing. 
Deacon duty isn't having a deacon's meeting once a month and, and chewing the pastor out because you didn't think he visited enough people or doing that. A deaconing is when the deacons meet and the pastor says, okay now, the deacon in charge of visitation, how many homes did you all visit this past week or past month? You see, the pastor's job is to preach and to teach and to pray. That's what his job is. And to be like an overseer, and then if it's too big, he can give an administrator to help him oversee. But that's the pastor's job. And so you had the deacons were appointed to do what the ministry, the pastors, in this case the apostles were the pastors, they said, look, my son is one of the best preachers you'll ever hear in your life. One of the best you'll ever hear. That, that young man probably spends 20 or 30 hours a week on every sermon that he preaches. I'll go by his house. And he'll have entire days. He'll just sit right there and stay right there. He'll study this. He'll study that. He'll look up this. He spends all those hours in that. And then he spends hours in planning programs to raise up leadership and to oversee and plan in the music program. He has many areas. But the ministry of, of caring for the practical, natural things, these are things that deacons are appointed to. So there's no concept in the Bible. And I am a, uh, I also teach church history, by the way, so I'm a very strong student of church history. And I can tell you that in church history, the deacons were somebody who was appointed Maybe uh, the cook for the pastor and his wife, the deacon has cooked and clean house so that he and his wife or the, the ministers could go out and be involved in ministry and reaching people and doing things and whatever else. Or maybe he was a deacon in charge of taking care of the, the building where they worshiped at and he would you know, clean it up or do something. Maybe he was in charge of checking on the widows and making sure the widows were taken care of. And, and they'd be sent out. Each one had a different responsibility, and they were sent out to take care of the things they were sent out to take care of. Now that makes a church grow. That makes a church cover all the people because the deacons are deaconing. They're not just becoming some board, like a corporate board or some political board that sits around and, and talks about what needs to be done and vote on this and vote on that and usually chew the pastor out a little bit. Uh, for this and not doing that and whatever else. You know, I was in, and I, I don't want to offend anybody, but you know, the truth is the truth. I, I was in a congregationally governed church visiting with my students one time. I was letting them experience different kinds of churches and how they worship. And so we happened to go on Deacon Sunday where they were installing new deacons. And, uh, and so the head of the deacon board was overseeing the service that day. And all, and he kept telling the people, you know, we're in charge of the church and we do this. And every time he referred to the pastor, he called him by the first name. Mm -hmm. I was sitting there and, I, and one of my students said, are you hurting? I said, I'm hurting, but it's not physical. Mm -hmm. I said, I'm trying to keep myself in my seat. Mm -hmm. And he said, what's, what's wrong, Dr. Miller? Mm -hmm. I said, I want to stand up and rebuke that man so bad I can hardly stand it. But I, I probably offend everybody here in the church. It was sickening. Sickening. That deacon standing up there calling the pastor by the first name. Like he's some little hireling. Some little boy that runs errands for the deacon board. Kind of a thing. It was absolutely disgusting. It was absolutely disgusting. And that's what happens in so many deacon boards. Now... When you have groups like some of the fundamentalist Baptists do and where they understand from the very beginning that deacons are there to serve the pastor and the people and take off of the pastor, that's where you see a lot of your big churches built. When you see a really large congregational church and they built a great church and they've got this and they've got that and they've had the same pastor for 20 or 25 years, that's when the deacons there in that church understand what a biblical deacon is supposed to do. They understand that God's given this man the vision and we're here to help him. We're not here to work against him. We can give advice, but we're not going to be sitting around voting five to four and three to six and seven to eight or whatever else. We're here to help serve. We're not going to keep our mouths shut if we think he's doing something wrong, 
But that doesn't affect my support. That doesn't affect my appreciation. And I'm sure not going to go out and talk about it after the meeting to somebody in the congregation. We're here to help. We're here to serve. We're here to deacon. To be deacons. And that's what deacons should be. And when it, when it works like it should, you'll see great and mighty things take place. It says right, the very next sentence, the very next sentence, as they say that, and they, and they laid hands on them, verse 7 says... Then the word of God spread, the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and even a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. Look at that. And that's what happens when a board does what a board's supposed to do. When they there not to be a board, but to be servants of the church and servants to help the pastor and trying to and, and the leader trying to accomplish the vision of God, that's when they're blessed. Now, let's look at this scripture here that so many people look at. Let's 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 look here. Let's go to 1 Timothy 3. 1 Timothy 3. First Timothy chapter 3. Now, notice what it says here. It starts out about a bishop and so forth. And then um, it goes on down, talks that it shouldn't be a novice, and then it goes on down, and then it moves down to the deacons in verse number um, 12. It says, let the deacons be the husband of one wife, ruling their children and their own houses well. And it says that they will attain for themselves a good standing and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. Now, that's one of the things that a deacon does when he does his job good. He will become a man of great faith. Look at the first deacons. Philip became an evangelist. And Stephen was our first martyr because he was out sharing the gospel. Deacons aren't supposed to just do physical things. Their, their work and them giving themselves, God says, it'll cause their faith to grow. If they get in there and do what they're supposed to do, their faith's going to grow and I'm going to use them. And they're going to speak the word. They're going to see mighty things happen. They have purchased, notice it says, they have attained for themselves a good standing and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. They have attained good standing. Good standing. Now, verse number 10. Let's go back to that one for a second. It says, uh, verse 8 actually. Likewise, deacons must be reverent, not double-tongued. Okay, if you got somebody as a man as a gospel priest, it shouldn't be a deacon. Not given to much wine. Not greedy for money. Holding the mystery of the faith with a pure conscience. Let them first be tested. That's why I say that they should be like deacons in training. They should start out as a deacon in training. And if they keep doing you know, people say, oh, I, I want to do something. I, I have people all the time tell me they want to do something. And then when I call them on, well, I can't do it next month. I can't do it next week. I can't do it. No, no. When they say they want to do something, you sit them down and say, now look, this is what it involves. I'm expecting you to have this heat on, these church doors unlocked, or this air condition on. I'm expecting you to make sure that the janitor's got everything clean and everything's done. And I'm expecting you to have ushers appointed and standing at that door ready to start service. And if you can't, you have somebody appointed that takes your place and do it. And all he's got to do is fail two or three times on me, and I'll tell you what. I'll say, when you get ready, if you get time, let me know. I can't operate a church coming in here and things not like they're supposed to be. I expect everything to be on order when I walk in that door. When I say something, I mean it. Sometimes people say, well, I know you said this, but I thought it would be better that way. I said, I didn't tell you to do what you think. You're here to do what I need to be done. I, you're doing what I would do if I had the time to be here and do it. So now if you think something, you tell, you tell it to me, and then I'll decide, maybe you got a better idea. But when I come in and what I've told you to do is not done the way i told you to do it, then you're not a bit of help to me at all. You're more of a problem than you are a help. So that's what you tell. Now, and then you says this. 
Let them be tested. Let them serve as deacons, being found blameless. And likewise, and notice the King James says, their wives. Mm -hmm. One time I had a class. We're not this more than one time, but on uh, one particular occasion I'm thinking of. And I say over half the class was foreign students, internationals. Romania, Bulgaria, different ones. I said, has anybody got a Romanian Bible as well as your English Bible? And one boy said, anyways, I said, I want you to read your Romanian Bible, but I want you to translate what it says in Romanian. He says, well, it says, let the deacons be the husbands of one wife. Uh, and, no, let's see what it says. It says, um, likewise, their wives must be reverent, not slanderers, temperate, and faithful all things. I said, now what does your Romanian say? And he read it in Romanian, then he read it in translating it from Romanian. Likewise, the deaconess must be reverent, not slanderers, temperate, and faithful in all things. The deaconess? The deaconess. Hey, they said, well, why is it that it says deaconess and in the English Bible it says their wives? I said, the same reason that you didn't see any women ministries back at the time of the 1600s because the Roman church did everything they could do to get women out of the church. Mary Magdalene became a prostitute and they made sure that that's what she was and, and you know, she was just a reformed prostitute and this one's that and, and, and ultimately they stopped letting their priest even marry women. They didn't want the priest to even have a woman. They didn't want him to have a wife you know, after about a thousand years. And they started that around 1000 A.D. or so. And so I said, you know, they kept on it by the time of the uh, church in the 15, 1600s. They didn't expect women to do anything. But that was not true. Women were very active in the early church. Lydia had a church in her home. Mm -hmm. Priscilla and Aquila. Not Aquila and Priscilla. Mm -hmm. Totally contrary to classical Greek to put a woman before a man. Why is Priscilla put before Aquila? Because just like Anne and John Jimenez, she had the anointing and he had the understanding. Mm -hmm. And so they worked together, but she was the one that had that anointing. Mm -hmm. The anointing was on her. Mm -hmm. She was anointed by God to ministry. And that's how it was. So deaconess is found in many other places uh, in the Bible. Uh, anytime it's found and used, it's, it's referring... Uh, Junia, for instance, in the last chapter of Romans, uh, she's referred to as a co-laborer, but also uh, uh, she's referred to as a minister in, uh, in the King James, but actually she was, a, the word there is deaconess. She's a deaconess. So women can be deaconesses. And why? Because deacons don't govern. They serve. It is totally unscriptural for deacons to govern a church. The elders govern the church with the pastor and the deacons are servants who serve and help take care of all the areas that the pastor cannot take care of. All right, we're coming to the end of our lecture now and I hope that you understand what I'm trying to get across to you. And when you read the book, you will see a lot of scriptures. You'll see a lot of teaching. You can go back in church history. You'll look for deacons and deaconesses during the first 100 to 100 years. You can look here in the Bible. You can look in the Greek and find out. Uh, women were very much in ministry. They said, well, Paul talked about not having a woman over a man. Uh, you no, know, he said, Paul said, don't usurp authority over a man. There's a difference in having authority and usurping authority. It's a world of difference. And that's what Paul was speaking to. I hope that you all learned something new today after that. And we'll join you for our next lecture soon. All right, goodbye.